Thank you so much. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, excited to have you here. I want to thank my colleague, Justin Williams, who also helped contribute some of the material for this webinar, uh, as well as introduce our colleague, Max Grover from Argonne National Laboratory, who will be joining us kind of towards the end of the uh, the webinar. He is our resident um, superstar at all things Python, scientific computer, and Jupiter, Jupiter notebooks, and he'll be he'll be helping us out. To give you a little bit of um, an overview of kind of the progression that we're going to use today, this is going to be a really low level introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. Um, it's not a course on Python or scientific computing. This is to help you understand, especially if you've, you've probably heard this word tossed around a lot, um, but maybe haven't had a chance to, to get in there and play with it and understand what this product actually is and how to use it. We're gonna go into that. Uh, we will take a look at ARM's implementation of Jupyter Hub as part of the data workbench ecosystem that we have developed. Uh, you'll actually get a chance to, if you are interested, if you have a, an ARM account, uh, you can sign in and actually play around with uh, our, our Jupyter Hub implementation. Uh, if you, didn't see it kind of at the start. I'll, I'll go back. That is the uh, the registration link at the bottom. Actually, if you do not have an ARM account, uh, if you do, you'll you're you're good to go. Um, or you can always do it later and then just uh, do the exercises on your own. We're going to talk about the different service levels that we have created in order to uh, make this implementation of Jupyter Hub something that meets the needs of a lot of different kinds of users from ARM's internal users and scientists who are funded through the ARM program to collect data through instruments, uh, individuals who produce uh, value-added data products in the ARM ecosystem, but also uh, the general scientific public. If you are uh, an atmospheric scientist or a scientist of any kind and you want to incorporate ARM data into the research that you are doing, uh, we will show you how we can create a computing environment that helps you achieve that. Uh, tied into the different service levels are also a uh, discussion of the file system structure and packages that are available to you. Those things kind of go hand in hand. So we'll talk about that at the same time. Uh, and then we'll follow up with a discussion of staging data to Jupyter Hub through the discovery interface. This is a new feature that we are super proud of. Uh, it is an approach to bridging the data lifecycle where we are connecting the discovery of data to the analysis and use of data in order to, to really bring all these different pieces of scientist experience uh, into one workflow. And then finally, our good pal Max Grover is gonna jump in and tell us a little bit about open science and ARM, talk about some of the different toolkits and uh, resources that the ARM community has created and made available to you, to the public, and then also ties in really well with the ARM computing ecosystem through the Jupyter Workbench. So with that being said, I'm going to dive in to uh, the most obvious question, what is a Jupyter Notebook? Uh, if Even if you are not a Python programmer, I know I have a few diehard Fortran programmers in my life, uh, you have you've probably at least heard of Jupyter Notebooks, uh, Python is the most popular language right now for working with Jupyter Notebooks. It does support some other languages, R, for example, Julia. Um, it is an environment that creates, allows you to create interactive code. It makes it very easy for you to communicate about your work and share your work with others who may be interested in the sense that you have a document that alternates uh, the markup uh, and the documentation aspects of it with blocks of code in a way that is super easy to read and share with others. The first thing I think that uh, confuses people when they start getting into this is they heard the word Jupyter Notebook, they've heard Jupyter Lab, they've heard Jupyter Hub, and it gets a little confusing trying to figure out what each of those different things mean. So I thought we we would take a moment to talk about the difference between the you know maybe the semantics. Um, the Jupyter Notebook is going to generally refer to 
the specific document, the specific artifact that is being shared and disseminated, that is being used to, to create and edit documents. When you hear the word Jupyter Lab, you're talking about a web-based interface uh, that is used for development. It includes all of the, the good things that you see here, the file system navigation. It includes the ability to create the notebooks. You can access a terminal, create text files, open up a Python console. So it's really that whole development environment. And when we get into Jupyter Hub, we're talking about the multi-tenant environment. In this case, the environment that ARM has created and made available to you. It allows each individual user to spawn their own private JupyterLab web server. And this comes with a lot of benefits because although Jupyter Notebooks and JupyterLab can be installed in your local machine, uh, it certainly makes it easier when you don't have to set up that in development environment. Uh, it can give a set of users a, a access to consistent uh, dependencies and packages. Um, and for our ARM community, it allows us to create shared storage and uh, on our network file system. It allows you to have your own personal project space that will be there persistently, allows you to share project space across users. Uh, and of course, as we'll see, this setup allows us to integrate with ARM's data discovery so you can seamlessly move from discovering data to analyzing the data. We're gonna start off by taking a first look at notebooks. So if you have never touched a Jupyter notebook in your life, now is your chance to do it. We've got several different ways that you can actually get to ARM's um, Workbench Jupyter Hub environment. You could just go straight to jupyterhub.arm.gov, uh, but I also am going to show you that we can navigate to it from the data discovery interface uh, and also from ARM's uh, homepage. And since this is a this is a demo as much as a PowerPoint slide. I'm going to share again, and we're going to look at Google Chrome. And hopefully that looks OK for all of you at home. Making sure that we still look good here on Zoom. So does this look good, folks? Do you see my, my or, um, Google Chrome? Yep, we see your screen. All right, great. So I'm going to start off by showing you if you are on ARM's homepage and you wanted to uh, go to Jupyter Hub, you could go to Capabilities, the Computing Resources, and then you could also jump down here and click on Learn More About Jupyter Hub. That will take you to our knowledge base and show you how to log in. The other way that you could navigate to this is going to our data discovery interface and going to scrolling down to the bottom. And you will see information about Workbench Jupyter Hub. You can learn more here in our knowledge base. And pretty much everything that I covered today is going to be available in the knowledge base, including how to log in, um, the different levels of service, and so forth. But we're going to go ahead and go to use Workbench Jupyter Hub. And as I mentioned, all I have to do is sign in with an ARM account. I'm going to do that right now. Now, when I log in, I'm going to see a couple of different options. Uh, this is due to the group membership that I am a part of. Uh, if you have not applied for access to Jupyter Hub, probably, or um, to elevated access to Jupyter Hub, probably the only thing that you're going to see is the Explore ARM data option. So uh, regardless of what choices you have available for you, I'd like you to go ahead, if you're following along, uh, or if you choose to do this activity later, to log in to Explore ARM data and hit Start. When I do that, my I get a message, my server is starting up. This is my individual server. Nobody else can log into it but me. And I start off here in the Jupyter Lab interface. And the first thing that I do is see that I can, uh, I've got a project navigation window here. 
because I am in this explore arm data environment, which is a temporary test environment, uh, and we'll talk more about what that means in the context of service levels later. Uh, we don't see anything here right now in my project space because it's not persistent. But I'm going to go ahead and fire up a Jupyter notebook by clicking that icon. So if you're following along, as I said, this is not a course on Python programming. This is a very basic introduction to the concept of what a Jupyter Notebook is. So we're not going to get very fancy. We're not going to do anything more complicated maybe than a hello world statement. In the context of this Jupyter Notebook, we see that we've got a title right here. We've got this funny looking block thing. And this is based on the label we see here. This is a code block. So that means in this block, I can execute Python code. I've got my code there. When I click the play button, it's going to execute the contents of this cell. Alternatively, we can also use what's called markup language to, to basically make our, uh, our notebook look a little fancier. Uh, we can use markup language or basic HTML. I'm going to do something super simple. I'm just going to create a header. Now, if I were to try to run that right now, uh, it would just think that this is uh, Python code. So I'm going to change the type of cell to markdown. And now when I run it, it renders the markdown as though uh, as it was intended according to the specifications instead of running it as Python code. That's it. If you've done this, if you're following along, you've made your first Jupyter notebook. I can move the cells up and down and rearrange them. I can add new cells. And I can, if I'm running a whole bunch of things, I could press this button and run them all at once. and it will run all of the code sequentially down the line. And the reason this becomes so handy is you can imagine when you're writing a complex piece of code, uh, it gets a little overwhelming when you have the choice of either filling your code with lots and lots of, of comments so that you can remember what you did yesterday or you know five minutes ago if you're me, um, or having really clean, concise code that isn't, uh, isn't well documented. The advantage here is by being able to incorporate the, the commenting and the documentation and the explanation in with the code, we have a much better product for disseminating and sharing with others what we're doing. And that really comes in handy when we're dealing with situations like you're trying to publish your results and you need to share the code as a condition of publishing or as a condition of your funding. You wanna archive how to, how to analyze your data with the data and with the uh, disseminated publication. This simply creates new options for you. Additionally, by using Jupyter Notebooks, you have the ability to create templates. So other people on your team, if they wanna redo the analysis, um, this is a very simple way to get reproducible results. We'll take a look around the Jupyter interface a little bit more. Um, I'm not gonna click on every single button and whistle, uh, but most of these are pretty intuitive, the ability to create files, to upload and download and so forth. Uh, we also, I'm gonna point out a, a few more things um, from the launcher. We can also enter a terminal. So, we have available all of the usual things we would do in Linux. Not gonna find anything much mounted here because this is not a, a setup with external resources available. We can navigate through using the visual file browser. And so forth. So it just gives you several different options for how you want to um, engage with code and the Jupyter environment.
The next thing that we're going to do is, uh, and I'll show you a more exam interesting example here, uh, under tutorials, we are in the process of populating a library of tutorials so that you will be able to, to just jump in and see really great examples of how to use Jupyter Notebooks to do environmental or uh, to do analysis. I'm not going to steal Max's thunder here. He's going to tell you a lot of really great things about pie art, um, but I borrowed some of his examples here just to show you what a full-fledged Jupyter Notebook might look like. And as you can see, Max makes really great, amazing looking notebooks. All right, so we have, um, we have seen what the Jupyter Notebook environment looks like, uh, done a, an example. I'm going to hop back over to the uh, presentation and we're gonna talk a little bit about the various levels of service that are available to you, to the different types of users. All right. So as I mentioned, we are we have designed this ecosystem to meet the needs of different kinds of users. Uh, we have internal ARM users. We have individuals who have who apply for elevated privileges within Jupyter Hub in order to do scientific analysis. Um, and then we just have uh, our default service level. I want to talk a little bit about what each of these things mean for you and, and then maybe we'll we'll jump back over into Jupyter Hub and I will log in using these different types of profiles in order to kind of show you around and show you what the difference is. Um, so by default, if you have an ARM account, you can log into this explore ARM data option. Uh, and important things to know about that are that uh, it is really intended as kind of a test case. It's intended for exploration. It's not really meant to be used as a production scientific analysis environment. Um, and that means we have no permanent file storage if you log in with this option. Uh, if you do any work and you like what you've done, you need to download it because after, after you, your session logs out, it will be erased. Um, and the computing resources are extremely limited. But again, if you've never played with a Jupyter Notebook before, this is a great opportunity for you without having to do any kind of setup or configuration to be able to just dive right in and have um, a whole wealth of packages and atmospheric uh, science computing resources available to you just to see how it works and to use some example products. The next level up uh, is uh, what we're calling our enhanced science access a science server. This is really meant for the general public outside of ARM. Uh, if you are doing a project and you want to use ARM's computing resources, we have a very simple application process for you. I will show you what that looks like here in just a minute. It will include permanent storage. Uh, you'll get a personal project space on our network file system, and that will be mounted for you whenever you log into Jupyter Hub using this option. Um, and uh, best of all, it does support scaling uh, resources. So if you need more CPU and more RAMs, we have the ability to, to let you make that choice when you're firing up your server and have those resources available to you. You can also use our new stage data to, from Discovery to Jupyter Hub feature. Uh, what this means is as you're moving around Discovery, you find data that you're interested in analyzing. You've got some you know, notebooks loaded up that you've built in the uh, Jupyter Hub environment. We're going to show you a very simple process to check out that data and have it staged directly to Jupyter Hub. You'll log in, it'll be right there waiting for you to analyze. No more of this. I got to find the data. I got to download the data to my machine, and then I got to upload my data to the computing environment. We've taken all of that extra work out of the equation for you. And finally, we have what is known as the, uh, the research system server. So uh, this is for ARM's internal users. 
I know it can be a little bit confusing if uh, you're on the outside, um, but we also use a lot of these computing resources to develop value added data products uh, for instrument mentors to monitor the data that is coming off of their instruments in order to, to do quality assurance. Um, so these are all kinds of internal users that may have need for access to things that the general public can't usually see. If you are any of those categories of user, you don't need to do anything special other than filling, uh, other than the existing research account request that you would have already had to fill out as part of getting onboarded uh, in ARM. Um, you may need some additional setup if you try to log in and it says that you're missing a home directory or something just let us know, email cluster support at um, arm.gov, and we can get that uh, fixed right up for you and you'll be able to log right in. Uh, this does include uh, permanent space again. Uh, it also includes access to the project spaces that uh, may, you may be using collaboratively with other ARM uh, research and development personnel. Uh, it supports staging data from Discovery to Jupyter Hub, and it also gives you direct access to non-public data resources such as data stream and archive. So it's, really, it's just another tool in the toolkit for you to do your job. So before I jump on to stage data to Jupyter Hub, I'm going to give you kind of a walkthrough example of logging into each of those different resources. So what I'm going to do is share my screen now back on Jupyter Hub. And there we go. Yep. Now there we go. I think. All right. So we're looking at Jupyter Hub again. And I am now going to go to File and Hub Control Panel. Uh, this is a good thing to know if you are ever doing some analysis and you realize that you you should have requested more CPUs or more RAM or you just need to restart your server for any reason. Something's being funky. You don't know why. You just want to restart. You can go to Hub Control Panel and Stop My Server. And in just a minute, it is going to let me restart. Launch it again. And this time I'm going to use the enhanced science server option. So again, this is the, the public option for you if you are interested in doing atmospheric science and you need a computing environment where you can store your work, maybe share your resources with other people on your team. This is the option for you. Uh, I can select various uh, options for CPU and RAM. And this time when I fire it up, I'm going to have some more options available to me. It's going to look a little bit different. And while I'm doing that, while that's firing up, I'm going to hop over here to the knowledge base. Now, remember, this knowledge base is where all our documentation is stored. It is accessible both on the arm.gov website, thanks to our good buddies at the comm team who have connected our Jupyter uh, data workbench information under computing resources. You can also find it on the data discovery page by scrolling down and finding that Workbench Jupyter Hub information area. And the information about different service levels is here, if you forget that. Um, but also the application instructions can be found here. So all you'd have to do if you have a project and you want access to these computing resources, uh, the, the barrier for entry is, is certainly much lower than Cumulus or our other uh, big guns. Um, and the idea is that you can, you can do your computational analysis in uh, ARM's Workbench Jupyter Hub. And then if you find that you need uh, heavier, more intense computing resources, then you could maybe fill out an application to, to Cumulus. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a, a very simple application process, just fill out a research account request as shown here. There's a link to, to where to go do it. Uh, you'll get a, an approval in uh, a few days telling you how to get started. You can sign in again with your ARM account and that will uh, allow you to submit the, the request and just say, I'm doing a project. Uh, here's what I wanna do with it. 
and it will be approved. I'm going to jump back over to Jupyter Lab now. Uh, you'll see some more interesting things come up now that I've signed in. Because remember, a, a few minutes ago when I signed in, I used Explore ARM data, and that was the the default um, exploratory uh, sign-in option that doesn't mount your personal storage or project spaces or whatever. Now that I've signed in to uh, the public-facing enhanced science server option. Now it's mounting those external storage resources. So you can see here, I have things that I have done and you know, notebooks that I've created in the past. Uh, I've got various directories. Uh, I've got my orders here that I have staged from discovery uh, and all of that is available. If I were to sign out and sign in as a different user, as an ARM internal user. And I'm going to do that right now. Um, if I were to sign in as a different user, uh, I would be able to choose the, um, as an ARM internal user, I would be able to have access to data, data stream and data archive uh, at the same time. Oops, having a little trouble logging out here. We need to, there my gosh. So um, with those different examples of what uh, ARM, ARM's Jupyter Workbench environment looks like for different kinds of users. The next thing I would like to do is hop over to the data discovery interface. So the data discovery interface, I'm gonna access that. Oh, I've already got it up. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna show an example of this exciting new feature that we have added uh, to our data discovery interface that allows you to send the data directly over to, uh, to Workbench Jupyter Hub. And actually for comparison, I'll show you here, we've got a, a couple of old orders that I did in the past and we're gonna create a new order. So I'm just gonna go to find some data and pick something random off the shelf and put that in my cart. Doesn't matter what it is. Now I'm going to go over and view the things that are in my cart and go through the checkout process. Sign in again using this account, the same account I'm logged into Jupyter Hub with. All right, so I'm signed in. My cart has a lot of stuff in it. I'm going to make it a little st smaller so I don't fill up my directory with random stuff. What do I? Uh, I'll just leave it. All right, so we're gonna to go to the checkout process. And the new option, if you have not used data discovery recently, you will see something new here, the stage data at Workbench Jupyter Hub. I'm gonna stage this to my um, data home directory. That's my personal project space. Uh, everything else looks the same, but I'm gonna go ahead and submit that data request. And here we go, we have submitted order number 239312. Now, depending on how many other orders are in the queue, it could take a few minutes. But uh, after that order has been submitted, I would come here and I would see uh, the data start to be populated um, according to uh, just as quickly as any other data order that we have submitted. So the nice thing about this here is um, using this example that I just submitted uh, a little while ago, uh, I didn't have to, again, I didn't have to download the data and then upload the data to get it ready for analysis. I, all I had to do was push a button and it was there. So for example, if I, um, if I wanted to access one of these data files from the order that I submitted, 
Uh, and just a, a quick um, pro tip, when you use this button, uh, be aware of where you're at in the project uh, navigation, because if you are in a, pro it's a place where you don't have um, write permissions to, or if you're in a place where you wouldn't maybe necessarily want to create a notebook, just be aware that whatever you've got open here, that's where it's going to create the notebook. So that's why I, I jumped up to Data Home and then my personal accounts uh, directory, because I didn't want to fill up my orders with my notebooks. I wanted to keep the data separate. I'm going to go ahead and create a, a Python notebook. And um, just as an example, let's say that I want to uh, open up a net, you know, an example of one of these files. Um, I'm going to run a little Python code. Uh, you can use all the tools that you normally would use in Python, like glob to say, hey, go to this directory and um, grab me everything that you see here, or kind of a, a convenient little trick that they make available to you. You can copy the path right there in the visual project browser. instead of having to, to manually figure it out. Oops. I do. All right, there you go. So there's, there's all the keys, there's all the variables. Um, so again, that was just a really easy way to have to avoid a complicated workflow of getting the data from where you found it to where you actually want to use it. And so there's our there's our, our new order number. So here's the the order that I just submitted a moment ago, 239312. And it's right there. Monica, we have a question in the chat. Awesome. Um, are IOP and PI data orders also located under the orders? Um, slash directory? So uh, any data order that you have requested through the discovery interface will be able to be avail made available uh, through the data checkout process. If it is something that uh, you have to request um, in any way alternative to the data order process, that would not be uh, available to, to stage two orders. Um, also, Monica, we have another question from Fawn. Um, uh -huh. I, I haven't seen the order folder yet. Do I need to refresh again? Okay, it will. It may take a moment if you have just uh, placed the order because it all. The, the thing about ordering data is it always depends on how many other people are ahead of you in the queue. So if um, some guy just requested two hundred gigabytes of of something, you might uh, have to wait a few minutes. Uh, the great thing is, though, it will automatically create the orders subdirectory in that data home username uh, file path for you. So just uh, easiest thing to do is the same way when you get an email uh, on any other day that your ARM data order is ready. Um, that's the same thing. It will tell you that, this, that that's also when uh, the data will have been staged in Jupyter Hub. Do you have any more questions? You might follow up. Those were um those were it so far. Okay. You might follow up. With well, uh, I will be sticking around after this. So if there are more questions, we can kind of consider the second half. You know, maybe office hour uh, to to help people get started or get answer questions and and navigate through this. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and. Stop here. Uh, that, that is the kind of the basic overview of what Jupyter Hub is, how to how to log in, how to get access to it, um, how to stage data from discovery to Jupyter Hub. And I'm going to let Max take over. He's going to tell you a little bit about, as I mentioned, some of the different uh, toolkits and the resources that the ARM community has developed 
And these work really well with the ARM Jupyter Hub computing environment. So Max, I am uh, passing it off over to you. Uh, before Max begins, Monica, um, yes, two, things. two things. Two um, things. Uh, Justin commented that IOP data are currently not included in this release, but will be added in the future. So IOP data, I think, won't show up in Jupyter Hub. Like, and maybe Justin needs to speak to that. So there was a clarification in the comments, and then, um, and and then Enrique had a. He asked, can you comment, Monica, can you comment on the positive and negative sides of users having to request the data to be staged to their home directories? I, he says, I thought we would have access to the data directly without having to copy it if we have to work with radars, for instance, the file size, sizes are big for Lasso. So okay. there's a couple comments in the chat. You. I'm assuming that this is speaking from the perspective of a, of a VAP developer or um, other kind of internal user. Is that correct? Because the type of resources that we have available, and I'm uh, I'm going to set something up here. Oh, I think you muted. Yeah, sorry, Enrique did say no, he is speaking as an external user, not as a okay. VAP developer. Okay, so um, no, you're ringing some bells now. So uh, regarding Lasso uh, and some other resources that have uh, maybe unusually large computational uh, data requirements, uh, one of our intentions is to, to develop, um, I, would, I would call a specific uh, profile, for example, the Lasso use case that would allow us to, to make that data um, available to you externally uh, directly, just due to the sheer size of, for example, Lasso. Um, our, our plan is to work with a project principal investigator to define a, a handful of things like, what are the specific computing resources that are needed for this? Uh, what are the dependencies? Um, and how are we gonna keep track of who's using that data so that we're, both um, meeting the needs of the user, a very, very reasonable need, you're absolutely correct, but at the same time tracking, meeting our requirement to the Department of Energy to, to be able to speak to who's using this data and how often. So we have a solution for that, I guess. Um, it is not on board yet, but uh, we can talk more about how we, what we can do to meet your needs right now uh, if you wanna get together after this, this, this workshop. Any more questions? Um, Rolanda, this is Giri. And uh, just, I'm with Justin here, and uh, we, we are typing together here. Uh, for the IOP data, yes. Um, so currently, the IOP data is archived in a different system, and we are slowly migrating into the regular archival and distribution system. So we are um, planning on on enabling that um, um, within this Jupyter notebook uh, in the future. Okay, appreciate that, Gary. Sure. Um, and we can share that in a blog or news post to the community when that happens. So mm -hmm. let us know. Absolutely, that would be our phase two activity here. Yeah, thank you. Monica, can you see my screen? I see you. Everything looks great. Great. Um, yeah, were there any more questions before we jump right in here? And if not, I can go ahead and get started. That sounds good. All righty, I'll jump right in then. All right. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Max Grover, um, software developer, uh, work with various open source, open science things uh, within ARM um, at, uh, at Argonne National Laboratory. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of give an overview of, of a couple of the, the key toolkits supported by ARM, uh, mainly being PyArt and ACT, which I'll cover what those acronyms mean in a couple of minutes here. Um, and let's jump right in. So the specific part of the, the open science space um, that I'm going to 
just give a brief introduction to today is the open source software component, which is the Python ARM radar toolkit or PyART, and then also ACT, which is the atmospheric data community toolkit. Um, so this is just sort of one part of how ARM is enabling open science. And I'm sure future webinars will continue to dig in um, to uh, the, whole, the whole stack here. So what is PyART or the Python ARM radar toolkit? Uh, it was originally created by Scott Collis and Jonathan Helmus in 2012. Um, and it's supported by uh, DOE, um, specifically the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement User Facility. Uh, there's been well over 280 citations of the package. Um, it's used broadly within the radar community. It's used both operations and research. Um, so it started off with some of the ARM research radars. Uh, they got it in, they, they figured out a way to, to read in the data and get it into this common radar object um, that we call it within PyArt. And then once you have this object, you can go through and apply your corrections or retrievals. Gridding is a, is a very popular component of, uh, of what people use PyArt for, visualization, um, and then also working with other radar packages out there. So fortunately, this, this toolkit was written generic enough where while, while it was originally written for uh, ARM, ARM's research radars, um, it, it works with other data formats. Uh, one of the most commonly used ones is the, the NEXRAD radar network. That's the radar network here across uh, the United States. Um, and there's also 13 other radar formats that are supported within PyArt uh, that people can work with. So the neat thing is this, this is a really nice framework uh, for the community to, get, to come together and um, ARM supports uh, a lot of the key infrastructure here, but we have some really nice contributions from the community. We've had over 50 contributors um, to the package uh, over the last 10 years. And it's it's a really nice toolkit um, that people can use to work with radar data. Uh, the, the other toolkit uh, that we work on is the Atmospheric Data Community Toolkit. Um, this was originally created by Adam uh, Tyson in, in 2019. And this is more focused on time series based uh, radar data sets. So basically a lot of the data sets that aren't necessarily radars. Monica, was there a question? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't sure. Um, continuing. Uh, so basically a lot of the, the instruments across ARM that aren't necessarily radars. Um, so this could, could include things that measure like temperature, pressure, humidity, that that sort of thing, um, as, well, as well as like a lot of the, the radiometers. So basically a lot of the other instrumentation that's not necessarily radars. And so th this toolkit includes tools for the entire data life cycle. So everything from uh, integrating with the data discovery uh, interface uh, through ARM, quality control. Uh, so actually applying some quality control flags or visualizing the quality control fla flags in the data. Data visualization. Um, so the actual uh, viewing your data towards the end. And then output to state to uh, some of the standard formats. So this is a nice little graphic that helps to visualize it. So it brings in a lot of the ARM data, which you can see that big ARM 30 years of data, uh, but then also brings in data from the physical sciences laboratory at NOAA, uh, the global monitoring laboratory from NOAA, micropulse pulse LIDAR data, CSV data, just general net CDF data, brings it all into this common object, similar to how we have the radar object in, in PyArt. And then once you have this object, you do anything you want with it. You can apply these different utilities. You can apply corrections. Um, if there, there's some quality control that needs to be applied, you can look at retrievals. Um, so for example, looking at where's the boundary layer height, uh, that's, that's one example. And then it also integrates with a lot of these other packages. Um, so these other toolkits like X-Array and MetPy, which is super helpful uh, for meteorological analysis. PyArt, like I, like I just mentioned, PySP2, uh, which is a specific tool to work with um, basically uh, particle data, and then EMC squared, which is connecting ARM data to uh, Earth system model data. So th this really extends beyond, beyond the radar uh, toolkit, like I mentioned, and brings in the broader set of, uh, of data um, provided by ARM and provided by the, the community. So how do you get started? Um, as I sort of mentioned in the chat, fortunately, both of these packages are already installed on the workbench on the Jupyter Hub. Um, so they'll be installed in that base environment, which is really nice. 
Um, and if you're looking for, for learning resources, I, I'd encourage you to check out the documentation pages, uh, which I'll go ahead and copy and paste these into the links, these links into the chat as well. Um, so if you go to the official PyArt documentation, um, you can go ahead and do that. And then we also have the official ACT documentation. And especially on both of these, uh, the place I usually like to start is the example gallery, where you, you get an idea of what you want to do. So for example, here, the, it's showing the, the PyArt gallery where we have the uh, reflectivity attenuation, so correcting for reflectivity attenuation, um, and then also de-aliasing Doppler velocities. If you're not familiar with radar, these might seem like very weird terms, but basically it's a lot of the, the data cleaning process. And so you'd, you'd want to go to one of these examples and figure out, okay, how do I apply this to my data? This is a workflow I want to do, and then you can go through and, and follow that. Uh, the other place to get started, so we've started to put together these cookbooks, um, basically examples, integrating the whole process of uh, downloading some sort of ARM data or, or reading uh, right there on the uh, the Jupyter Hub, um, and then more detailed tutorials into to, to PyArt and ACT and, and other packages, and uh, really giving uh, researchers and the community the tools to, to get their work done. Um, so we recently taught a, a short course at the American Meteorological, Meteorological Society annual meeting, where we're focusing on data from the sale field campaign, uh, which is in uh, the Rockies out in Colorado. And during this tutorial, we covered how to get started with radar data with PyART, observations, other observations with ACT, a little bit on aerosol and, and meteorological data, and then a really dig into X-ray, which is a commonly used Python package uh, for the, the geoscience community. So if we actually click on this cookbook here, um, it'll take you to this page, um, which is uh, a collection of, of Jupyter notebooks. Uh, it has all these nice buttons that would drop, would that would launch you directly onto the Jupyter Hub where it's directly integrated there. Um, and then if we go to like the PyArt basics here, this is uh, similar to the notebook Monica uh, briefly showed before. Um, and so, we, we have this, this nice structure where you get an overview of what's going to be covered, some prerequisites, um, so some refer or, uh, recommended reference material. And then we dig in and we start coding. Um, and we, we walk through um, how, to, how to read in your data. This radar is out in uh, Colorado. Like I said, this is, um, yeah, out in, out in the mountains of Colorado, which you can see through that nice, uh, nice gift. Uh, we walk through how to read the data, how to plot your data, all the different options available, including RHIs, which are basically vertical cross sections. And all of this runs on the, the Jupyter Hub. So I just change over to another tab. This is the notebook, and this is in just the base environment that comes installed on uh, the, the Jupyter Hub, like Monica was showing. And you can just hit shift enter or your little play button up here. And it just works. You can go through and, and learn how to get started uh, with some of these open toolkits. Really dig into some of the sample data here. Here we're looking at one of the PPIs, which is one of the types of scans that was taken. Look at the data. Um, and then we can actually plot it. So towards here, let's just create a quick plot here. We're plotting the corrected reflectivity. Uh, we'll give that a second and then it'll render that. Um, yeah, you can see mountains. So we got lots of beam blockage where uh, the, the radar beam is running into terrain, which is to be expected. Um, but yeah, so what, what's nice is is these packages are installed and we work with uh, the data team and, and the infrastructure team to make sure that these, these packages are up and running uh, for the community. Um, it's really nice having the software like right next to the data and making it as easy as possible uh, for users to, to get started uh, on their open science journey. So yeah, uh, any questions? Are there any questions? 
looks like no no new questions in the chat. Monica answered okay. a couple. Um, uh, feel free if anyone wants to drop theirs in the chat or you are able to um, unmute yourself if you'd like to ask um, that way as well. And I'll uh, drop an email uh, into the chat as well. If you think of questions, um, you can always email cluster support at arm.gov. Uh, and we will that will open up a ticket and let us know right away that you have a question for us. Or if uh, anything is not working as expected at any point, if you need help getting logged in, um, you can also hit that email as well. But yeah, absolutely stunning, Max, as always. No, <laughs> thanks. And um, we will be sending out a link to the recording file of this webinar. It's going to be on ARM's YouTube channel. We also will be including within that message um, a short um, survey that we do ask that you complete on today's webinar as well. So that, watch for that. That'll be coming out soon. Um, so if um, Monica, if there's nothing else, you can go ahead and uh, <laughs> close it out. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, have a great day. Thanks. Thanks so much, Monica. Thank you.